Mm-hmm. Well, I want to start by uh, sharing uh, a story with you, and uh, I don't know if it's one I've shared before, but um, it's a story of this, uh, of this lady who was known as having great faith. Uh, she was this elderly lady, but she was very vocal, and she had a very loud voice, and she was very bold in, uh, in proclaiming her faith. And she would stand out on her front porch, even, and she'd yell out to passers-by, Praise the Lord! Well, next door to her, um, ironically enough, lived an atheist. And uh, this atheist was, uh, would get very angry uh, with this lady's proclamations. And so they started this sort of contest, and she'd yell, Praise the Lord! And then he'd yell back, There ain't no Lord! And it would sort of go back and forth. Well, at this one point in her life, hard times uh, befell this lady, and she prayed to God to send her some assistance. And she stood out on her porch, and she shouted out, Praise the Lord! God, I need food. I'm having a hard time. Please, Lord, send me some groceries. Well, the next morning, the lady went out on her porch, and she noted a large bag of groceries. And so, of course, she shouted, Praise the Lord! Well, at that precise moment, the neighbor jumped out from behind a bush and said, Aha! I told you there was no Lord. I bought those groceries. God had nothing to do with it. Well, the lady started jumping up and down and clapping her hands, and she shouted out, Praise the Lord! God not only sent me groceries, but he made the devil pay for them. Uh, once faith can get one into conflict sometimes, whether it's with a uh, belligerent uh, neighbor, uh, perhaps it uh, comes about through conversations or even arguments with people of different viewpoints, maybe the atheist or agnostic, or perhaps even of different religious backgrounds. But where I think a lot of times we find conflict with our faith is within ourselves. When we become exposed maybe to different belief systems, but more than that, When life gets hard, when doubts start to emerge, when we feel pain and we see pain around us, we start to question our faith in a good and loving God. And it's in these times, in these dark times, uh, where I think we say our faith is tested. Because I think it's in those times where we find it really difficult to pray to God. When we are angry, when we are fearful, when we doubt, Do we bring these things to God? Can we pray at that time? One of my favorite uh, films I really enjoy is uh, uh, called The Apostle. Anyone here ever seen it? Robert Duvall is from the 90s. And uh, he plays this rather engaging, charismatic, and deeply flawed uh, preacher. And uh, one of the things I loved about him, there's this scene where he's in his uh, his mother's bedroom and he lost his uh, his ministry and his family. And, uh, And you just hear him shouting out, Lord! I love you, but I'm mad at you. I love you, but I'm mad at you. I love you, but I'm mad at you. And he's screaming, and the neighbors call uh, to find out if there's some raving madman in her house. And uh, and his mother just explains, well, sometimes uh, Sonny uh, talks to the Lord, and sometimes he shouts. And I thought this was a really neat um, example of a person who's able to express anguish and anger even to God. Because you see, in the Psalms, like the psalm we read this morning, are uh, really very honest. This psalm and the psalms that we read earlier in this week, too, uh, uh, was lamenting this really difficult state the people of God were experiencing, particularly as they were living in Babylon. They had been conquered, they were taken away as slaves, they were captive, and there were psalms that, uh, that long for vengeance, for God to make things right, and, uh, and sometimes even brutal imagery is used. And today we have more of a, of a sad psalm lamenting the good old days, lamenting the days when they were home and the sights and sounds all around Babylon, and we read often of the rivers of Babylon, were sort of these reminders of how different this place was from their homeland. It was like rubbing salt in the wound that they were not home any longer. And the phrase that really stuck out with me from this psalm uh, that we uh, heard today was that they hung up their harps. They hung up their harps. These are people who were deeply religious, 
who loved to celebrate and sing of the greatness of their God, who, uh, who knew how to have a good party. And the music was a huge part of that. But they become so destitute, so desperate, so depressed, that they hung up their harps, they put them up on the wall, because they couldn't find a reason to celebrate any longer. Now eventually, we know that, uh, that they, many of these people were able to return home at one point. But the power, I think, in the Psalms is that they are able to express the deep anguish of the human heart. And in the face of that anguish, they could express it to God. They felt comfortable enough in their faith to talk to God, to be angry with God. And they did it through prayer and through song. And this really is part of the legacy that the early church inherited. If we remember, sometimes we need to remember that the early church was, by and large, a Jewish population that had come to believe in Christ as the Messiah. And St. Paul was one of these people. And in our epistle reading today, we have him reminding his young protege, Timothy, of the legacy of faith that Timothy had inherited from his religion, we know, but specifically in Paul's letter from his grandmother, Lois, and his mother, Eunice. Now, some people believe that Timothy might have been as young as 18 years old when he began his ministry under Paul, if you can think of that. But I don't believe that for a minute that Timothy would have been able to carry out this important work if it wasn't for the nurturing faith that he received at home. Timothy's story made me reflect uh, uh, on my own life, my own upbringing, growing up in a pastor's home with parents that uh, prayed with us, that read the Bible to us, that uh, brought us to church, and not only on Sundays, and Sundays was a, was a whole event, we had evening services too, so it was like a whole day thing, but we'd also be at the church multiple times during the week usually for uh, children's and youth ministries. And I was a very shy kid in school, but in church is where I really learned to find my voice, where I really learned to, uh, to open up and to, uh, to have fun and become more social. And most people think if you can get up and speak in front of uh, hundreds of people at a time that you must not be introverted or shy, but I can assure you that's not the case. Um, but really, it was at church in that context that I learned to be able to, um, to open up. But I also learned about God's personal love for me. It was at church that I learned that God loved me, that cared for me. It was at church that I uh, prayed with others and had others praying for me. And some of my earliest memories are actually in of being at church. The ideas that I would learn there and the teaching that I learned would be modeled by my parents at home. And I think really if we think about it, all of us can probably think of some people in our lives, perhaps a mother or a grandmother or a father or a grandfather, perhaps sort of spiritual grandparents and parents that mentored us, that invested into our lives, that brought us to Sunday school, that taught us at Sunday school, all of us have people that have sown seeds of faith in our lives. I think today's readings invite us to think about that. What have we inherited in the faith department? What people have impacted us? Who has shown us God's love by caring for us? And also, what have we received from our faith tradition? I get asked the question all the time, what made you become an Anglican <laughs> after not growing up in this tradition? And there's lots of different answers that I give, but also because I think it's important for those who are cradle Anglicans, which is, by the way, one of my most favorite Anglican terms I learned in seminary <laughs> for the first time was a cradle Anglican. If some, of you, if some of you might not know what that means, basically you're just born into the Anglican church and baptized and you grow up in it. And I always thought it was a funny term. I never heard of that before. Um, but when, when talking with people about that, I think a lot of the time we have to sort of reflect on what are the riches that we've inherited through our tradition. And one of the first things that might come to our mind is, of course, the liturgy. We are quite known for, uh, for a liturgical component of the service, for the systematic reading of God's Word uh, through the lectionary readings, but also the presence of Scripture through our liturgy. And uh, folks might be surprised to know, and, and I tell this to some of my friends who are very... Uh, you know, very big on reading the Bible. And I said, well, you know, in the Anglican service, we read more scripture than just about any church tradition out there. I said, what? Really? I'm like, oh, yeah, it's full of scripture. It's wonderful. And it's wonderful to hear all the scripture read each week. We might reflect a little on uh, other times in our lives through church ministries, like Bible study groups, uh, spiritual retreats, parish retreats, 
uh, pastoral care we've received from clergy and from laity, uh, music that we, uh, that we listen to and, and that we sing and get involved with, and uh, that God's faith grows in us through these things. These are all wonderful, uh, uh, a wonderful inheritance that we have received. The work of uh, the church is to continue to reflect on these things and to also explore new ways of growth. And that's what our uh, insight team really is, is about. And many of you have been involved in the conversations we've been having and part of sort of a, a visioning process of hearing about uh, why you've come to St. Matthew's, what keeps you coming back, what do you love about it here, what do you, would you like to see uh, moving forward. And uh, our insight team has sort of merged with the parish selection committee and now we're calling it Insight 2. This was the revelation this week, we're going to call ourselves that. And uh, really it's an intentional uh, time to develop a strategy for ministry moving forward. But I think it's really important that that's a twofold process. And the one part is plumbing the depths of our faith inheritance. Of those things that we have had and that we do uh, grow from and have been blessed through. But also exploring new avenues and new ways of growth. I found that we Anglicans oftentimes are shy about, um, about our faith, about declaring our faith, or even our level of spirituality. Um, I think we can be quite self-deprecating, actually. Um, and part of that maybe is a struggle we have with articulating our faith clearly. But also I think we sometimes get caught up in that comparative game. You know, both as individuals thinking, well, that person has a really strong faith. I don't measure up to them. But we might also think that way in terms of churches. Well, those people over there and those Christians over there, like the lady in the story this morning, are very vocal about their faith and very loud about their faith. Boy, they seem to have a lot of faith. I don't have that kind of faith. And it's easy for us to get caught up in those, in those games. And we might uh, relate to the disciples today who were asking Jesus to increase our faith. See, because the disciples had just been, uh, uh, this reading happens on the heels of Jesus giving some rather hard uh, tasks to the disciples. To go out and to, to heal diseases and to preach the good news and to not carry any possessions with them. To rely on God's care and provision for them in their day-to-day -day lives. And the disciples were afraid that they weren't up to these standards. They were afraid that they would fail in their mission. So they asked for their faith to be increased. But Jesus tells them that all they need is a minuscule measure of faith to be able to move mountains. And this is because in God's kingdom, miracles do not come about because one's faith has earned them. But in Luke's gospel in particular, we have an emphasis that faith is always related to God and God's actions in Jesus. It is not so much what humans do or do not do, but what the limitless power of God does. Faith is the openness to God's power. Faith is an openness to God's power. Another way I've heard it, one of the best definitions I ever heard of faith was, that's a simple trust. Simple trust. And I think this is good news for us because it's not about accumulating, you know, and we're in a consumerist culture, so sometimes we apply that to spiritual things too, and we think if we can just get more of this and more of that, if we can just get more faith, then that will get me through. But Jesus is reminding his disciples and us today that it's not about having a huge amount or a small amount, that all we need is a simple trust. It doesn't have to be a big thing. It just has to be a simple trust and openness to God's power. And God can bring about great things in and through us. It means that even when life gets so stressful and it's grueling, even when the times when we are angry or upset, and times where we even doubt God, if we keep that simple trust that God still hears our prayers, we know that God will grant our requests in ways that we do not even understand. The seed of faith remains within us. This means we do not have to earn God's love and blessing. We don't have to try to muster up enough faith or motivate ourselves. It means being open to what God would do in our lives. And so this morning, may we pray that prayer that, uh, that Paul gave to Timothy as well, to rekindle the gift of God that is within you, to plumb the depths of the, of the riches of faith we have received and to continue to grow in new ways. Rekindle the gift of God that is within you. Amen.